What you're about to see are clips from the FWC non-native species tag group meeting on April 27th. TAG is a technical assistance group, and this was appointed by FWC to address non-native species issues in Florida and assist with the creation of regulations. In this video, you'll see FWC staff, Melissa Tucker and Sarah Funk, present the TAG group with two options of whitelist regulatory systems. These systems were rejected by the vast majority of members on the committee, all the animal industry folks. The only people who are strongly in favor of them seem to be the animal rights activists and some of the government folks and some of the environmental advocates on the committee. Um, I did want to make sure that we had communicated back to the tag that Thomas Eason, our acting executive director, did have an opportunity to check in with our chairman, um, um, Chairman Barreto. And the chairman has indicated that he really does want to see draft rules at this commission meeting and that he wants to see both of the options that we have discussed with you previously. The first option that we discussed applies to non-native fish and wildlife species that are not documented in commerce in Florida. And this would restrict importation of any new undocumented species. So species currently in commerce would maintain a regulatory status quo unless a future risk determination necessitates reclassification. All right, so um, just to recap what the section op second option was, it applies to non-native fish and wildlife species that FWC has not evaluated for risk in Florida and FWC has determined are not sufficiently regulated. This option restricts importation of any unevaluated non-native fish and wildlife species. Species that have been evaluated would maintain the regulatory status quo unless a future risk determination necessitates reclassification. So that's the option that we presented on the slide last time for option two. At the last tag, there were interpretation one and two. Um, I just was wondering if there was a reason for that nomenclature change or if there, if it's gonna change at the commission meeting to option instead of interpretation. Yeah, we will use option um, for the commissioners. Is there a reason for that? Or just, that's no reason? Okay. The number of species that have been evaluated is about, if I recall correctly, the number at the last meeting was 205. And I'm not sure which estimate we're using for species in trade, but we're at 30,000, 40,000, somewhere in that area. I'm not sure if even that 205 has been analyzed by FWC. Those may only be FDACs. So, I'm assuming that it's even less than 205 species that have been reviewed by FWC. So we may be looking at 20 or 30 species that have been reviewed by FWC. And most of those are probably already listed as prohibited. So it could be almost zero species that are going to be allowed in trade. And as Joe just said, the commissioners need, need to hear those numbers. So just to clarify, both options will be industry colors. One is just quicker than the other. Adamantly do not support option one or option two. We are also against both interpretations, um, even interpretation one, and I do want to make sure that that's clear. I'm going to have to change my concern about interpretation one, interpretation two, whatever you want to call it. I'm a big hell no. I'm going to use kind of a obscene uh, example. It'd be like getting the choice of, of being put to death with lethal injection or being put in a gas bath and being lit on fire. Neither one of those two options, even though it was kind of a force venue, were very palatable. Yeah. I think we need to uh, readjust and, and look at the possibility of a, a third more palatable sure. option and, and the possibility of a blacklist that we've already got. I understand what you're trying to do and where you're at. And I think where people got uncomfortable here and, wh and why they're wanting to reiterate their, their positions is that we went from these were two interpretations of what we thought the commissioner said so now these are two options that we are presenting to the commission. And that's that's why this is getting such a vehement pushback sure. here is that every, everybody that's feels true. like that was a little bit of a bait and switch that we were told these were just interpretations and now there are two options being presented. So it came up that sometimes staff is given direction, but sometimes has to go back to the commissioners um, and kind of give them feedback about what they view as possible or practical. So um, you know, we're, we're hearing that you want to present interpretations one and two, um, but I just want to be clear. I feel like there was at least as much support for a third option 
uh, which would be an expanded blacklist as there was for either of the two options that we looked at uh, and, and discussed at the, at the previous meeting. So maybe this is a situation where, you know, staff does need to push back a little bit on the commissioners and say, we understand what you're asking for, but we feel like we have a more practical solution. Yeah, so certainly the commissioners are up there and we all understand how you know, FWC is set up and what role the commissioners serve, but we also got to think about what their background is. And I hope that, you know, staff will present if there are issues, just because a commissioner comes up with an idea doesn't mean it's practical or, or it's going to work. You know, I'm not sitting up there telling them how to develop land. And I can only imagine if every idea that a bunch of land developers have, we wouldn't have a gopher tortoise or any other endangered species left up there. So again, I know they set up there and had an idea about how FWC and the various animal industry should operate but it doesn't mean they were correct or it doesn't mean it's reasonable what they said what we were discussing previously that low risk species may be authorized to be imported but there's a caveat part to that provided that no other factors of concern are identified during the initial risk screening conducted by fwc so i'm listening to sarah talking about all these scientific reviews and everything else and then she falls back on her caveat despite all the science peer review, risk analysis, assessment, screening, all of that stuff. The caveat is if FWC, despite all the science, if we don't FWC like it, we're going to not allow it. And so, you know, that's not a good faith gesture. I've said in the past that uh, I do feel that FDEX um, should be at the table um, since I don't think uh, FWC or anyone at the table there wants uh, duplication of uh, regulation. Okay, yes. Um, yeah, I still don't see where uh, any of our existing BMPs uh, fits in all the risk analysis that we already do for aquaculture and and still where where does we where do we fit in with uh, FDAX? You know, FDAX is the lead organization for aquaculture. So that that none of that's been brought up. I guess the commissioners understand that FDAX is the lead organization for aquaculture, correct? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> we have not discussed that with the commissioners, so I'm not aware. <laughs> I know that most of the commissioners have never been to a fish farm, you know, so. I mean that that would be the biggest thing is is trying to get an answer answer that way. You know we have we do all those <clears throat> species that we farm raise right now have been through a risk analysis and and uh, although we've talked about this at at earlier meetings, you know we're at this point now. You know what I'm saying? Where where this has got to be this has got to be brought up and talked about for aquaculture. So um, I think that's a big problem. Up on Gino's point, so herpticulture, the reptile world, witnessed this as we were going through prohibited species listings, where the commissioners were never properly educated on how the conditional species program worked. You know, the reptile people tried to inform them as best we could in the you know two minutes that we were allowed to speak, but I don't, I do not recall staff ever properly educating the commissioners on how the conditional species program worked. So to Gino's point. I haven't seen the commissioners be educated on FDAX and how aquaculture works through FDAX. So I think that shirt certainly should be pointed up so that they can make an informed decision rather than just as assuming that they, they may know how FDAX and aquaculture works. Where is FDAX in all this? So suddenly FWC goes to a white list, clean list, you know, whatever you want to call it. Now what's FDAX going to do? They enforce a, a dirty list. And so are they going to look at one thing and then are they going to be FWC inspectors that come to fish farms now and, and spend, uh, how long would it take to go through Seagrist in a day and identify every single fish that's in there, even though there's a, you know, there's a label on it. It would take me hours and hours to go through there. And I know fish really, really well in the industry. These commissioners are not educated. Uh, they haven't visited anybody. I wish that they would. I wish, Melissa, you would invite some of these commissioners to come to a tag meeting. You know, I can remember tag meetings in the past where commissioners and, rep and legislative representatives would come to the tag meeting and watch the process and get a firsthand review of what stakeholders 
are concerned about. So I just want that noted how uh, in, in our notes as you guys move forward. And sure. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll mute myself. Okay. Uh so I, I would um, request that anyone, you know, at the, at the last meeting that brought up this concept of a blacklist, it would really like to hear specifically, what do you mean when you use that phrase? What it means to me is a list of species that are disallowed or species that are allowed on a conditional permit only to be sold out of state only. Because to enforce, you can enforce, you know, a few dozen species that, that the agents can easily identify or you can whitelist thousands and thousands of species that they have to identify which are the ones that are not allowed. So currently, under current law, you cannot possess piranha for any reason, but you can possess something that can be contained, like a freshwater stingray, and that can be contained and shipped out of state only. But FWC, with a conditional species permit, makes sure that the containment is proper for that animal so that it can't reach the natural waterways. I just want to make sure I fully understand. So I think for you, the phrase blacklist could incorporate, like, for example, current conditional regulatory classification, current prohibited classification, or something like the piranha, which is kind of a unique case where it's almost completely not allowed. With a blacklist, the default is freedom. If it's not on the list, and it's permitted. If it is on the list, that doesn't mean it's completely prohibited, but that means there are conditions applied to that. That could be the same as our conditional species permit, that, that could be prohibited, that could that could mean a lot of things. But it and the part of the goal of it is to make sure that your law enforcement officers have a smaller list of things they need to know that if I see this animal, then I need to check. Say, does this person have the permit for this? Do they have um, the rights to have this? Or is this something that's completely illegal and nobody in the state should have, like a piranha? The issues with the white list or the clean list or whatever you want to call that list, I mean, we've, we've discussed that, and it's a very difficult thing to do on a large scale. You know, what is, what is uh, acceptable, what is not? It's going to be very difficult for the officers to determine what species. We've seen in the last month the pretty significant problems that law enforcement can have with identification of things like boas and and, uh, and pythons. And, and we had the same concern expressed by Major Burden a couple months ago at a tag meeting that a extensive whitelist would be extremely difficult for law enforcement to, to be familiar with. I just want to reiterate that there is support for among the tag members for uh, a whitelist. And, and commission meetings going back a few years, leadership, the commissioners have mentioned specifically mentioned um, mentioned the whitelist. We, we really strongly feel like a whitelist um, is, is important for, for the goals at hand. You know, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of speculating about what the commissioners are thinking. So I'm going to do that too. I don't think they have an idea the number of species and the complexity of identifying a clean list across the board. I just think it's going to be a, a disaster. And you know, I'm sitting here listening to all of, all of you people and it seems like a wildlife agency is trying to get into the agricultural business. And the only thing missing at this tag meeting is somebody from the cattle industry. A lot of species that look very similar, it's it's possible for an officer to come in and say that they, they don't believe that's the species on the white list. They think that it's a species that's not on the white list. Um, and the concern is that, you know, you'll have officers euthanizing animals in, by mistake because they don't understand which one it is. And so that's that's a big concern there. Where they have been implemented, whitelists have been wholly ineffective at preventing the release of non-native species into the environment. Whitelists are industry killers where they have been implemented, and the people on this call and the people within the industry want to protect the environment, but we're going to be put out of business um, by this. Whitelist is going to lead to more mistakes from law enforcement. Um, your agency is going to have more more situations arise like what we just saw with Bill McAdam, and I know nobody wants anything like that to happen. Again. Having having uh, something other than a blacklist of things that should be easily identified, it, we're probably going to see that come up again. There's a lot of things in option one that we like, um, also option two, um, perhaps soon thereafter. But as you guys know, we do support the whitelist. I have to support whichever path leads to the most environmental protection, the least amount of risk. For the options we've been given, that's going to be option one, and it's going to be for the whitelist. I would support a, a blacklist rather than a whitelist because um, we all know that whitelists have always been ineffective. I do know that blacklists 
work whitelists have some problems there is no consensus on this issue and that the commissioners need to be aware that we've got 20 people plus with a multiple opinions and nuances within your opinions on this issue. We will be making the official staff recommendation of moving forward with option one and the risk process um, so that we move those things into rulemaking. I, I really think we are largely informing on this because this is one of those things where staff recommendation just it just is and, and it's not something that we we really have input on. This tag group has been meeting for a year and a half now. They've had nine meetings, and uh, if you talk to the TAG members, they're very frustrated that they've spent all this time trying to be involved in the process, and in the end, it doesn't look like their input is even going to be considered in the creation of the regulation, because what FWC's presenting now has been vehemently opposed by all of the animal industry interests on the committee. Meet up at the Florida State Capitol for FWC Day on Tuesday, May 2nd. This is an opportunity for us as reptile keepers to educate our elected leaders on FWC's egregious overreach and inhumane treatment of animals. Meet at 9 a.m. in the Capitol Courtyard and be prepared to communicate with legislators in a professional manner.